September 1st, 1666, London. As we travel down one city street in London, all of our senses are ignited. Visually, it could be quite overwhelming to anyone not accustomed to it, with merchants of all kinds, from those who sold chickens to those who sold cloth. London could provide something for everyone. Now imagine all the sounds that go along with that, as well as the sound of horse hooves on the street. And let's not mention the smell of poor sanitation in animal entrails. That would be enough for any modern-day observer to gag. But in 1666, it was just another day. After surviving the Great Plague of 1665, Londoners must have looked forward to 1666, much like we, in the present day, have looked forward to a future without COVID-19. As we recently covered in the episode titled Wife of the King of Mistresses, Catherine of Braganza, the following events occurred during the first four years of Catherine's time in England. While fire was common in London at the time, they could not have foreseen the events that would begin to unfold in the early morning hours of the 2nd of September. A fire had broken out at a bakery on Pudding Lane. The conditions were right. Most buildings in London were made of wood, and the weather that summer up to that point had been hot and dry. Ripe conditions for a disaster. The fire started at a bakery that belonged to Thomas Farriner, the king's baker. It is believed he initially put out the fire after a spark from his own oven hit some type of fuel in the kitchen. Unfortunately, by the morning's early hours, his house was ablaze, and the fire began to spread. The conditions were, as I mentioned, ripe for disaster. The wooden buildings quickly caught fire as firefighting efforts appeared hopeful until the wind fanned the flames further. The fire raged for four days, and the change in the wind conditions likely saved London from further damage. What is most amazing is that only six lives were lost in this historic fire. A contemporary of the time, Samuel Pepys, tells us in his own words how word spread the day the fire broke out. Quote, Some of our maids sitting up late last night to get things ready against our feast today. Jane called us up about three in the morning to tell us of a great fire they saw in the city. So I rose and slipped on my nightgown and went to her window and thought it to be on the back side of Mark Lane, at the farthest. But being unused to such fires as followed, I thought it far enough off, and so went to bed again to sleep. About seven, rose again to dress myself, and there looked out the window and saw the fire, not so much as it was, and further off. By and by, Jane comes and tells me that she hears that above 300 houses have been burned tonight for the fire we saw, and that it's now burning down all Fish Street by London Bridge. So I made myself ready and walked to the tower. Once there, I got up upon one of the high places and did see the houses at the end of the bridge all on fire, and an infinite great fire on this and the other side of the end of the bridge, which, among other people, did trouble me. Having stayed, and in an hour's time seen the fire rage every way, and nobody, to my sight, endeavoring to quench it, but to remove their goods and leave all to the fire, and having seen it get as far as the steel yard, and the wind mighty high, and driving it into the city, and everything, after so long a drought, proving combustible, even the very stones of the church, and among other things.
Pepys then traveled by boat to Whitehall, and he continues by saying, He went up to the king's closet in the chapel, for people come about me. And I did give them an account and dismayed them all, and word was carried in to the king. So I was called for, and did tell the king and Duke of York what I saw, and that unless his majesty did command houses to be pulled down, nothing could stop the fire. They seemed much troubled, and the king commanded me to go to my lord mayor, Sir Thomas Bloodworth, and command him to spare no houses, but to pull down before the fire every way. The mayor of London, to the king's message, cried like a fainting woman, Lord, what can I do? I am spent. People will not obey me. I've been pulling down houses, but the fire overtakes us faster than we can do it. As the fire raged on, people continued to try to leave the city and poured down to the River Thames in an attempt to escape by boat. As a last resort, gunpowder was used to blow up houses that lay in the path of the fire, and so create an even bigger fire break. But the sound of the explosions started rumors that a French invasion was taking place. Even more panic. But by Friday, September 7th, the fire was over. Peeps goes on to say, Up by five o'clock, and blessed be God, find all well and by water to Paul's wharf. Walked thence and saw all the town burned in a miserable sight of Paul's church, with all the roofs fallen and the body of the choir fallen into St. Faith's. Paul's school also, Ludgate, Fleet Street, my father's house, and the church, and a good part of the temple, the like. In all, 436 acres of London were destroyed by fire. This included over 13,000 houses, 87 churches. St. Paul's Cathedral was completely destroyed. The official account of the fire in the London Gazette concluded that the fire was an accident, that, quote, it stressed the role of God in starting the flames and of the king in helping to stem them, end quote. Despite this, residents were inclined to put the blame for the fire on who else? Foreigners, particularly Catholics, the French and the Dutch. An example of the urge to identify scapegoats for the fire is the acceptance of the confession of a simple-minded French watchmaker named Robert Hubert. Now, Robert claimed that he was the member of a gang that started the Great Fire in Westminster. He later changed his story to say that he started the fire at the bakery in Pudding Lane. Hubert was convicted despite some misgivings about his fitness to plead and hanged at Tyburn on the 29th of October, 1666. Now, after he died, it came out that he hadn't even been in London on the day the fire broke out, but at sea. In 1667, strict new fire regulations were imposed in London to reduce the risk of a future fire and allow any fire that did occur to be more easily extinguished. The Great Fire of London was a huge disaster for the city of London, but it put into place measures that would ensure this would never happen again. A monument was erected near the northern end of London Bridge to commemorate the fire. On it, three sides of the base carry inscriptions written in Latin. On the south side, it describes actions that was taken by King Charles II following the fire. On the east, it describes how the monument was started and brought to perfection. And on the north, inscriptions that describe how the fire started 
how much damage it caused, and how it was eventually extinguished. These words were added to the end of the inscription on the orders of the Court of Aldermen in 1681 during the Popish Plot. An inscription in Latin translating to but Popus frenzy, which wrought such horrors, is not yet quenched. Text on the east side originally falsely blamed Roman Catholics for the fire, saying, quote, Burning of this Protestant city begun and carried on by the treachery and malice of the Popish faction, unquote. Those words, blaming the Catholics, were eventually chiseled out in 1830 with the Catholic Emancipation. Well, that concludes this special Patreon-exclusive episode on the Great Fire of London, which was a supplemental episode to Wife of the King of Mistresses, Catherine of Braganza. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for being a patron. Patron.